Okay, so hi everybody. This is uh, Jacob at Jacob Lebowski on on Twitter here, and together with me is uh, Adam at Rizfiz on Twitter. Hi, Adam. Good to see you again. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you too. So, um, so Adam, just uh, before we jump into this Q2 uh, 2021 earnings call on Good Food, uh, which this YouTube video is about, could you uh, could you say a few words about yourself, who you are, and um, and um, and and why you're doing a Q2 presentation on uh, on Goof, Good Food? Sure. Um, so, first of all, like I'm a Canadian living in Toronto. I'm a Good Food customer. Full disclaimer: I also uh, am an investor who has a position in Good Food. To me, it's just a very exciting uh, company in, in, a, in a very exciting space. What about you, Jacob? Yeah, super cool. Thanks for that, Adam. So I'm myself, uh, I'm following, following you and uh, as, a, as a good food customer and similar to you, the disclaimer is that I'm, uh, I'm also um, uh, invested in, in good food uh, long term. I think that's an important disclaimer. We, we, both, uh, we both love the company and, and follow it a lot and, uh, and have an opinion about it. And, uh, and that is what we will try to, to dig into today. I think just before we dig into this, Adam, I think it's uh, also important to say that both of us are long-term perspective good food investors, meaning that we don't necessarily speculate the day up to or on the day of the, of the earning calls. Um, we try to absorb everything interesting that, uh, that is coming out of the company, but we use that information as part of our long-term evaluation of, uh, of where the business is going, right? So if we try to dig into to the earnings call, which came in today, um, Adam, could you try to, to walk us through uh, when we're talking about uh, key figures um, regarding subscribers and, and revenue for good food? How did you view uh, on that what, what, they, what they reported as, as of today? Yeah, so I was actually uh, really pleased, especially with the, the revenue number. What they refer to as an active subscriber is, is either a good food wow customer or a meal kit customer. Um, who has ordered within the last two weeks. Seems like if you kind of skipped more than uh, a week, two or more, then they're going to count that as somebody who's kind of churned off. But uh, just to touch upon that, so to anybody new to Good Food, this is a key uh, KPI, which they typically always report on as it gives an understanding about how's it going with the, with the customer base. And exactly like you just elaborated on, the definition is very important to understand how it is they count uh, a subscriber as obviously every type of uh, business uh, with an online groceries could, could have their own definition of this. Uh, how about the revenue, Adam? How, how did that come in uh, compared to... Uh, the, the very few, we always talk about that there are so few analysts covering good food, but the, there are a few. And how did that come in compared to uh, analyst expectations for the for Q2? Looking at the analyst expectations, there there's very few, only about four. And uh, the the range that they were estimating for revenue was was around was around from about 90 million to 98 million at the high end. So they actually exceeded the analyst expectations, which was which is great to see. And another really interesting thing to note is that although subscribers were only up 30%, the revenue is jumping up 71% year over year. So they're really dealing with huge, huge uh, benefits right now from being able to deliver to more customers in a concentrated area. And it really, really helps them with their gross margins and, and the amount of revenue that, that they can make. Super, super point, Adam, on that. And um, to elaborate on that, what you probably also could say is that the greater Toronto area rollout of Good Food Wow, um, is, this is the first quarter where we are seeing the, the, the beginning of that. Yeah, fiscal Q2 ends for them February 28th. Yeah. And I believe that Good Food Wow, it's hard to remember the exact date, but I, I feel like it was sometime uh, early February that they, that they launched that. I think you're absolutely right. So we're even more interested to see in Q3 when we're talk, going to talk uh, to, uh, Toronto rollout of uh, of Good Food Wow, um, but, and great to see the company just uh, just moving forward on uh, on these two key uh, key KPIs. Moving forward uh, to gross margin. So if anybody new to Good Food, I think it's just important to to uh, 
to elaborate a little bit on, 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 on the GP. So uh, traditionally, uh, groceries, incumbents and brick and mortar, especially, uh, but also brick and mortar trying to transform into online, have a really, really struggled to try to maintain high uh, gross profit margins. Um, what we see in, uh, I've seen for the last couple of quarters at Good Food is that they're realizing uh, GP in the area of 30%, which also came in at 30.4% as we see in uh, Q2 2021. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that, Adam? Uh, how how you view the the gross margin in term in the in the relative one uh, in terms of percent? For sure, yeah. Well, um, I mean, for one thing, you're going to notice that for for food, the the gross margins of of even thirty percent are are quite high compared to what a lot of people are used to seeing, especially in like traditional grocery stores, uh, supermarkets, and uh, the previous quarter, the gross margins were actually slightly higher at around 33%. Um, however, due to some of the promotions that they were rolling out, I mean, this is speculation, but most likely due to a lot of the promotions that, uh, that, they, that they were doing in order to uh, expand their online grocery offerings, uh, there's been a little bit of compression in, in gross margins. However, management said during the earnings call that they do expect expansion actually in even in the short term to their their gross margin, which is absolutely, I mean, to me, it's it's incredible that they're already at 30, 33% gross margins in, in food and, and they expect this to increase more. It's uh, uh, it's very, very exciting. Uh, I've, I fully follow you on that. It's so interesting to hear that they actually don't talk about it as being abnormally high, but more talk about it as being uh, something that comes naturally from have, having this fully vertically integrated business models and only talk about the further opportunities there are for uh, economies of scale across fulfillment, across auto automation and fulfillment, across uh, logistics with uh, how many um, how many orders you can have on the same truck and so on? So that's uh, that's really, really fascinating. And I and I think um, and I think you're right in the sense not only in, in speculation, but I think also the COO uh, Kagi um, also mentioned this um, uh, re regarding the promotion. You're absolutely right. Took a to, in that quarter took a hit uh, to the to the relative uh, gross margin. Um, looking over to uh, adjusted EBITDA, I think what uh, is interesting and has to be said there is sometimes you see companies posting adjusted EBITDA where they treat it like a big uh, trash can, putting everything in there uh, to trying to, to disguise a bottom result. I think uh, good food um, has to be mentioned that this is the fourth consecutive quarter where they're doing a positive uh, adjusted EBITDA. And adjusted EBITDA, when you read the, the fine notes in the management presentations, uh, contribute of a very... Um, very close to a one-to-one -one real EBITDA. So it's only some some extreme one-off costs they, they put into that um, EBITDA. Adam, how, what are your thoughts on, uh, on, on Good Food both being a good growth company, but also on the fourth consecutive quarter now uh, delivering a positive adjusted EBITDA? It, it just goes back to what we were saying about that, that subscriber growth and kind of getting that economy of scale. And when they can get a, um, a high concentration of subscribers in, in, in a densely populated area or even within, you know, any kind of a postal code where they can get even 15, 20, 30 subscribers. Um, it, it just completely changes the, the, the pricing structure and, and the and delivery costs for them. They, you know, they, mm. they're able to get their delivery costs down to sub $5. And I think that in some areas, they've even reported before having delivery costs around only two dollars per per user. It's um, it's 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 fantastic what you're saying there, and it's also um, and it also comes to something that you have been uh, you have been describing to me at at earlier stages. For instance, I think you also had this example of that when you because you are yourself are a good food wow customer, um, and you and you uh, also mentioned this point about um, that actually some of the frozen items 
when they're delivered to you with uh, with good food Dural at, at same day delivery, don't need the same sort of packaging as you normally would have to have on, on, sort of, on these uh, type of products. And what I found interesting was actually having this in the back of my head because you described it before. Uh, Ferrari also actually commented on this at the, I think it was during the, the Q&A, exactly on this point about, about costs. Um, so there's just so many still seems that they're still at an actually an early stage in realizing all the cost optimized potentials that come out of the, the economies of scale, as as you exactly mentioned there. Adam, how about the net loss and the earnings per share? Uh, the negative six cents. How did that come in compared to where we were expecting this uh, this Q to come in? Of the few estimates that there were, I think it was only three or four estimates, and. Uh... They were all between uh, negative five cents and negative six, six cents a share, so it's uh, pretty much in line with estimates there. Exactly. I think just just the two of us just doing this video, we are basically doubling up on the, on the analysts covering good food. <laughs> so, <laughs> so 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 we have to put in our estimates in the, in the upcoming in the upcoming Q three. Great, cool, Adam. Adam, just. Um, when uh, when tuning in for people that uh, that haven't participated at the at a conference call uh, like Good Food are, are doing and similar to uh, to other public companies, uh, first part of it is presentation of uh, KPIs. There's a full management presentation which is available on uh, for the Good Food Investor Relation part of the website. Everybody can can have a look and browse through that. So that's why we're also leaving leaving that point with, uh, now during this YouTube video. And jumping right into uh, six highlights that you and I um, each took uh, out of the, the Q&A where analysts and, uh, uh, have a chance to, 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 to ask questions to, to Ferrari and Kagi, the, the COO. And um, some things that stood in mind, Adam, uh, one thing was that the WOW customer is engaging much more flexibly and across their assortment. This was something that Ferrari touched upon when, when discussing the Good Food Wow, which now has has had uh, one and a half uh, quarters uh, of be of being live. Yeah, it's it's really cool, kind of the way that they describe people using the service. Uh, seeing that there is kind of a smaller basket size that the Good Food Wow customers are preferring right now, but they're really trying to grow this through kind of what what they are referring to as. Uh, building an experience for the customers that's more about discovery and and they refer it they refer to it as uh, walking the aisles i believe and uh so they have this kind of big picture discovery i know that is a problem like you know when you go to a grocery store you end up buying more things because there's so many things you know it's kind of you're overwhelmed you, you you're, you're you're on your way to look for your your pasta sauce and on the way there you're going to see so many little like and displays for, for other products that catch your eye. So this is something that they're trying to replicate and, and always thinking about when they're building their user experience. I think that's that's super interesting what you're saying. Um, and you, I think a lot of people uh, that you and I discuss with on Twitter when we discuss good food or, uh, or in small in, in investor groups. Um, so a lot of people are buying into, I know you and I myself uh, are also doing that uh, the business case in good food being the grocery part. So coming out of the meal kit business and developing into the grocery part. And, and it was quite interesting, I think, to hear Ferrari talk about that meal kits is something that the traditional meal kit customer for them have more been a planned customer. So you more plan your, your meals and what, what sort of needs you have. And good food, wow, what that obviously offers the, the, the company is that they can address the customer base, which is which has more flexible need, needs, right? Because um, if you get the same day delivery, you're already uh, bought into the subscription. Um, you can much more uh, buy in and buy out of uh, of the assortment, and and, and also good leading us uh, over to uh, point two of the six highlights. Uh, you and I have been discussing this. Uh, after we heard Ferrari make this statement, but normally for people who haven't heard any podcasts or any uh, quotes from the CEO, Jonathan Ferrari, he's normally a quite calm, conservative kind of, uh, kind, kind of CEO and uh, not, uh, not too Elon Muskish. Uh, so, so I think this was, is a really strong statement when, when he's saying that uh, 
that we will have certainly built, we have certainly built an engine at Good Food that is creating and launching really by far private label grocery products at the fastest pace that any grocer is moving across North America when he's referencing that. And this was a quote where an analyst was asking regarding the, the pace of, of new product adaption, saying, quoting Good Food, uh, mentioning at a previous uh, investor relation talk that they would surpass 1,000 uh, SKUs in the online grocery parts by the end of 2021. At a current date, they have 750, um, meaning that they, they are really, really rapidly increasing on, on assortment. Uh, when you hear that, what is your takeaway for, uh, from this part? Yeah, to me, I mean, there's there's a few things that that uh, really stand out to me. And, and one is that I think that when they launched Good Food Wow in February, um, they mentioned that there was about 600 SKUs. And here we are, you know, not even two months later, and we're at 750. And as a as a customer, kind of browsing week to week, it seems to me like they are adding about 50 SKUs at least each month. Um, so if, if you look at kind of where, if they continue on that pace, which they seem like you know they're going to continue moving at a fast pace, and they know that they can move at a very fast pace. Um, there's a good chance that we might end up surpassing that uh, 1,000 SKU uh, estimate by 20 to 20 to 30 percent. Even it's hard, hard to say for sure um, if they're gonna if they're gonna keep rolling things out at, at this fast of a pace. But it's it, it has to be because they realize like you know they're starting a grocery business from the ground up. They're not able to lean on products like Kraft or Heinz as a, a crutch. You know everything is kind of in their own control. And if, if they want to compete with, you know, full assortments of product, uh, private label at other groceries and also compete with these, these large incumbents that they're going to have to move very, very quickly and, and be able to serve uh, all of the desires of their customers. And, and so far they're, they're doing a really great job of uh, getting that up to speed. Yeah, that's super cool. So, um, for the whole business case, it's just, uh, I, I really view it like that, that every single uh, SKU that they put in there, that's that's just added value, uh, a potentially greater uh, basket size, a potentially greater flexibility for the customer. Uh, it, it's just completely it triggers in into the economies of scale of, uh, of, the, of the business. One thing to add is like they, they care so much about the customer experience and, and it's not like they're just releasing private label grocery items for the sake of having them you know a checklist like yes we have sugar yes we have bread mm. like all of the products i've had are, are actually incredible and and some of them are even um you know maybe they're some of them are kind of more premium uh prices uh but a lot of the regular items you would get seem like they're priced very competitively with a grocery store and a lot of the premium products are, are, are like what you would expect from a local butcher or a local bake shop. They're not just like supermarket items. And they, they care even so much about the packaging. Like the packaging is, is very appealing. Even though you don't need to find it on a shelf, you're just browsing it on an online page. They still care so much about the packaging when they don't need to stand out against Kraft or Heinz. And, uh, they're even hiring a director right now of uh, the the packaging design. Cool, Adam, and that is uh, super on point. That uh, this is not just something where they uh, just press a button, but that there's really thought uh, going into that. Uh, Adam, I know you've been uh, really interesting to uh, interested in the demographics of, of, of the good food customers what, uh, and leading us to point three of the key takeaways. What did you hear or, or read actually in the management presentations of that part that caught your eye? They're, they're seeing like uh, more customers of all ages and demographics kind of engaging with their brand. And they said that they now have as many customers in their 60s as they do in their, in, in their 20s, which to me... You know, I would usually think as someone in their 60s as kind of being late, late adopters or very, very low uh, adoption rate compared to people in their 20s, kind of like young professionals living out of a condo. 
yeah, that the, these would normally be uh, later on adapters. Moving on to the last three quotes, um, Ferrari talked about, he actually used a lot of time. Uh, there was, I don't know what triggered exactly the, I can't recall what triggered the question from, from an analyst, but he used a lot of time to talk about the core differentiators. And I think you mentioned it also uh, just uh, just a while ago in this, uh, in this video uh, regarding the walking the aisle um, uh, experience that they're trying to create something that there's, uh, that there's a discovery element, both to the new product development uh, that goes into the thinking there, but also obviously he must be referencing the UX of, uh, of the whole shopping experience, that, that you have a shopping experience where you normally, if you look at the traditional supermarket, you have a part of your shopping basket is a shopping list, things you know and need to have that you go to uh, to the supermarket for and something that you more spontaneously are inspired about and uh, and that was i think so fascinating to hear him really evolve there and and give more in-depth uh, insight into how it is that they, they view this as a as a as a core differentiator to uh, to uh, to other online competitors and uh, and um, and also to uh, to existing uh, brick and mortar uh, businesses and um, at item point five, uh, if, uh, regarding where, where Ferrari said that there's the good food is seen between 20 and 30% of, um, of additional cost pricing to the customers through what he calls the personal shopper model. Um, this is something which uh, straight up uh, made a bell ring in my head because you, you, you mentioned to, the, uh, to me this before and the coming... I personally live in uh, live in Denmark, and um, and what we're seeing the the traditional incumbent supermarkets doing there is that they try to have a the brick and mortar business, and then they try to build an online business next to it. Um, but what I understand on the Canadian model is that the incumbents actually um, send groceries to the traditional brick and mortar shops, where they are actually uh, picked and packed. Uh, to 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 deliver to to pure online uh, uh, customers, and this is this is of course what uh, Ferrari here is referencing when he's talking about the personal shopper model, um, the virtually integrated business model of uh, uh, of good food. That is uh, also what we're what we're seeing when we're talking about the increased gross margins, the possibility of being competitive on pricing that uh, that they don't have to uh, to give over a higher price to to the customer uh, any thoughts on how how you see that uh, the, when looking at it from a business model perspective yeah well a lot of this just comes from kind of um the space that they're coming from they, they never had this legacy retail business um so they were built from the ground up with online first being the only uh, customer that they that they had to deal with. Um, so, like you said, right now, when you know, not all grocery stores, but but most grocery chains in Canada, um, what what I see them doing is they're they're distributing and, and shipping products to the grocery stores. Then they have someone stock the shelves in those grocery stores. A customer will make an order. They have someone. Um, you know, then retrace the, the, the aisles and, and take the items off of the shelves, package all of those uh, products into bags and, and baskets. And then a customer will either come to the store and, and pick those up, or they have a delivery service of their own, or they use some kind of external service like Uber or Instacart. And then you also have the issue of not having the inventory of the store tied to the online experience. A lot of customers are only really getting 80% or so of the items that they're ordering online. No, try to compete with, uh, uh, good luck for the incumbent trying to keep compete with a vertical integrated business model like good food on that part, I guess. Um, and then the last uh, part, which was um, the, it was one of the last analyst calls, uh, questions uh, on the conference call, but, but a super relevant one because uh, for people following Good Food, they noticed that at one point, I think this was late January day or start February, they, um, they had a, a press release saying that the CFO of the company, Philip Adam, um, who has to be mentioned is not one of the founders. He came on later on board. Um, was also was a shareholder, but but not a great shareholder like uh, like CEO and COO. Um, but nonetheless, they have been uh, without a CFO for for a time, 
and they're doing an executive search on that. And Ferrari commented on uh, on that part um, and giving great confidence in that they have both a have had a great uh, short list of candidates. Um, uh, B that they're very comfortable in that uh, they will uh, uh, select and lock in the candidate very shortly. And um, I read in, in between the lines. That's how I saw it. That they will probably make an announcement very soon. Um, the day where. Um, uh, they announced that Philip Adam was leaving, by the way, um, that single day in late January or start February, the stock took a, took a hit on probably on that news alone of uh, proximity of 10%. Uh, so, um, so I think it, uh, I don't think that uh, if Jennifer Ferrari or Neil Kagi uh, uh, are lacking anything to do in the company. So I think it would be nice for them to, to get a, Full CFO member of the of the top management team again. Um, Adam, Adam, hi. Anything on your side to add on on that part? Yeah, I can just note kind of uh, like the team that they've been building is is a super diverse team of people with with really great backgrounds. Um, if you if you look into the backgrounds, I mean, uh, Jonathan Ferrari, I think, has a background from RBC Bank. It's one of Canada's uh, big five banks, the, 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 the leading bank in, in, in Canada. And uh, they also have management from Loblaw um, companies, Procter & Gamble, uh, Uber Eats. And uh, I think that people are excited by the vision uh, of, the, of the leadership. And, and you know, it's, it's a very exciting company to us. I'm sure it's a very exciting company to a lot of prospective candidates and I think that they have no problem uh, finding the right person. Yeah, cool, Adam. So, Adam, that also leads us to the conclusion of uh, of this uh, walkthrough of um, of the Q2 results of Good Food for 2021. Um, so, uh, from here in Denmark, over to you, all the way in Canada, I'd just like to say thank you for um, for 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 the walkthrough uh, that you've been uh, you've been doing here in this video. If you would like to uh, know more about uh, good food, um, uh, then uh, feel free to follow RizFizz or Jacob Lebowski on Twitter or subscribe to our YouTube channel where we will do frequent videos uh, either from uh, quarterly presentations, annual presentations, and, and also we, uh, we're right now planning to do some, uh, some, some more in-depth videos uh, to give a more broad insight into, into good food. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. Have a good night. Thank you too, Adam. Bye.